is a good sign. Um, welcome, glad to see all of you. What a beautiful day. Um, we, have a, we have a guest with us. His name is Brad Stringer. He's sitting right over there. And he is married to Cindy's older uh, sister, Marla. And um, they live in Wheaton. And that they have been involved in a church very much like Believer's Chapel for years and years and years. And Brad, very involved in that church as an elder and teacher, song leader. And, uh, but they're in town to babysit their grandchildren. So uh, this is an indication of how badly he wanted to get out of the house <laughs> this morning. <laughs> and here was the excuse. So glad to have Brad. And we may have other visitors, I don't know. But if we do, we uh, welcome uh, those of, uh, of you who may be visiting. Uh, sometimes we have some in the East Parlor who are more comfortable uh, there. Uh, I'm about to pray, open in prayer, and uh, uh, you know, hopefully we'll resume our old way of doing things uh, soon, uh, where uh, we're actually having prayer requests, we have a longer time period to operate in, um, but uh, we're not there yet, obviously, so uh, we look forward to that. Let's remember Marie Anderson. Um, um, it was in the bulletin. Marie had a small stroke. Small strokes are what are the strokes that happen to other people. Uh, but uh, Marie's such a sweet uh, member of our class, so let's remember uh, Marie in prayer. And Marie, if you're listening, we're praying for you. So let's bow in prayer. Father, we thank you uh, for the great privilege that we have to be in this room together, the body of Christ, and know that you're here with us, uh, to have in our hands uh, your very word, and it's inerrant, and it's all sufficient uh, for us to follow after you and to be faithful to you. And we're going to be encouraged today uh, by your word to do that very thing, uh, to follow after you. And we pray that your spirit would enable us not just to comprehend these things, but to move to that next step and apply them to our lives and, and be obedient uh, to uh, these words. Uh, bless our, our church, bless the ministry of the word that will follow in, as Dan returns, and uh, bless all those who hear. May we lift up uh, songs of praise to you and hearts of praise uh, today, worshiping you. We do pray for Marie and ask for healing, and there are others uh, in our body who, who need our prayers in regard to physical um, afflictions and, and, and illness, and we pray for them. And, and other needs, too. Uh, we pray for our country. I won't turn this into a pastoral prayer, but we do pray for our country, that you'd show mercy to us and, and give us good leaders. Uh, bless us in the weeks and months ahead. Pray these things now in Jesus' name, amen. So uh, we're in Matthew 5. I think you know that, especially if you've got a, an outline. So turn to Matthew 5, and we're going to be reading verses 38 through 48. Like most good sermons, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount uh, contained identifiable sections, movements uh, that you can capture as you go through them. The most obvious is the section that he began with. It seems like a very long time ago that we studied it, but the first section was the Beatitudes. And today we come to the conclusion of the second major section of the sermon in which he's been correcting some perversions and misinterpretations of the Mosaic Law. And Jesus offers up, as you know, six antitheses introducing each with variations of the same formula you have heard it was said, followed by a quotation of the commandment or its misconstrued version, and then with unusual authority pronouncing, but I say to you, presenting then the true interpretation of the law. And we've come now to the last two of the six antitheses, but for all of them, the governing precept has been what was given in the 20th verse of chapter 5, unless your righteousness surpasses that 
of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And I know I've repeated that uh, in every lesson in this series, but that's because it is so important. This is uh, Jesus saying that governs the whole passage. And no, nowhere does that ad admonition seem harder to fulfill than in these last two, where Jesus describes the attitude a Christian is to have toward his oppressor, uh, toward his enemy. Uh, the, these are the frequent intruders into our lives that want to take from us what we believe is ours or out of hatred of us uh, seek to do us wrong. But Jesus would have his disciples understand that our lives are designed for something greater than self-interest, asserting our rights and enjoying the, the company of friendly companions. Uh, we perform in one sense before an audience of one. Uh, he is the only one who counts. And any rights we think we may have are subsumed under that single towering reality. We live our lives before God alone. And so in these final verses of chapter 5, Jesus gives illustrations of offenses that strike at what is dear to us, as we'll now see. So let's read the verses. Verse 38, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks of you, and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, here's a shift now to the, the sixth. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. That last uh, exhortation we won't spend much time on. It's a tough verse. Maybe that's not why we won't spend much time on it. But uh, to be perfect, you know, means to be complete, to, to come into the full possession of um, what is required, uh, what is available. To, uh, to, we know what perfect means, but it's got more nuances to it than that. I'll say something about it. So we see for his final two arguments, the Lord takes up two common rabbinic teachings, retaliation or revenge, and one's attitude toward his enemy. And the scribes had distorted the law on both issues. And it requires great faith and careful thinking on our own part in order to understand Christ's proper interpretation. It would be easy to take his words, for example, and conclude that a Christian should not care about righting wrongs, those first few verses there. And two, in the second place, you know, we have panhandlers, it seems, on every major intersection in uh, our city. Uh, are we displaying an unrighteous attitude if we don't empty our wallets and our purses every time we pass or come up to, to one of these uh, beggars? Uh, should we bankrupt ourselves in order to meet the Lord's demands that we give to him who asks of you? That's what the scripture says, give to him who asks of you. But those decisions would inevitably lead to tyranny first, 
and also destitution. So instead, we must find the principles that Jesus advances. Uh, for we see them permeating the Word of God in, in, in other places, that there are times when we must forfeit our perceived rights, and above all, we're to consider others as more important than ourselves. Uh, there is where we find the deeper meaning behind the Lord's words. Are we willing to relinquish rights which, uh, for all the world to see, honestly belong to us? And is there a willingness to disadvantage ourselves to advantage another, even, even when the other is hostile to us? And for what purpose? Well, such attitudes mark us off as different uh, than others in the world and identify us as belonging to our Savior, as belonging to Christ. Well, the first misinterpretation had to do with the law of retaliation, or as you often hear it in the Latin, the lex talionis, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That comes right out of the Bible in several places, but let's consider one, Exodus 21, 23, and 24. If there is any injury, then you shall appoint as a penalty, life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. It's the most basic and commonsensical legislation with roots uh, in the history of ancient civilizations, going back to the Code of Hammurabi in the 18th century BC. Its aim was twofold, to rightfully measure the justice meted out and to restrain onerous revenge. Leon Morris captured its essence well. It meant even-handed justice without respect of persons. No matter how great the offender, he could not escape just punishment, and no matter how small, no more could be exacted of him than his offense merited. It took punishment out of the realm of private vengeance. Now, technically speaking, and this is important for us to note if we're going to understand this, uh, the law was concerned with civil affairs and had its main application in the judicial realm where legal judgments were made. Of course, it had obvious moral underpinnings as well. But the error of the Pharisees was to extend it to personal relationships, uh, primarily to justify personal revenge. And Jesus' objection, which follows, dictates that in personal relationships, the response was to be covered not by proportionate justice, but by love. The ruling principle, according to Jesus, was non-retaliation when one was subjected to personal wrongs. And his would prove to be the primary uh, example, as the Apostle Peter would later declare in 2 Peter 2, verse 21, Christ left us an example, Peter wrote, for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return, when suffering, he uttered no threats, but he kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. In other words, Jesus lived his life before an audience of one. So, against the Pharisees' manipulation of the law for personal retribution, Jesus admonished his disciples in verse 39 to not resist an evil person. Now, you can immediately see how over the centuries since, Jesus' command could and would uh, be itself twisted to mean something he didn't intend, fostering a wide variety of non-resistance ideologies. Tolstoy, for example, uh, and this is one of the more famous reactions in the literature, wrangled from Jesus' words the idea that there should be no police or, or armed forces or even civil magistrates. Uh, he interpreted Jesus' words as a prohibition of all 
physical violence to both persons and institutions. Gandhi uh, followed after uh, Tolstoy. He, in, he developed his theories of passivity. You know that about Gandhi. He developed these theories during some of history's most tumultuous conflicts during the rise of the Nazis in, in Germany and the totalitarian communists in Russia and the horrible conflict of World War II. And he had plenty of advice, Gandhi did, for suffering Jews in Germany and, and put upon uh, peasants in Russia, urging nonviolent resistance to both. But Gandhi was himself uh, immersed, as one critic has observed, uh, among a people, India, shaped by centuries of concern for the spiritual, uh, a people uniquely capable of understanding and accepting that kind of a message. But Jesus was not offering geopolitical advice for governing states. Uh, the individual's responsibility toward evildoers was his concern. And the Apostle Paul later captured that concern in like manner in Romans 12, 17, when he instructed, never pay back evil to anyone, if possible. And I've used this in, in my business when I messed up and I had to apologize to somebody. Uh, if possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. In other words, something of a theme here, you are living your life before God and God alone, so let him be God and leave vengeance to him. Well, the Lord's illustrations uh, supporting his point are very personable. They are personal. Uh, there are four of them each designed to illustrate the opposite of personal revenge, the principles, in other words. And the first is personal insults. Whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. This is probably uh, one of the, the, the best known. Uh, it has infiltrated our cultural consciousness that one has the option uh, not to retaliate when struck by another, but to turn the other cheek. But the lesson goes further than physical assault. I don't know how often you've really meditated upon this, but it's, it's not just physical assault. Uh, most commentaries agree that the slap that the Lord had in mind was the backhanded slap of insult. It's the act of one who desires not just to inflict physical uh, injury, uh, but, uh, the, to, it, but to uh, express indignity uh, to the person himself. And most people are right-handed. And so to clench one's fist and attempt to hit another on their right cheek uh, requires a bit of maneuvering, maybe an Ali shuffle to get around. You lefties are not exempt here, but you get the point. Uh, most people are right-handed. If you're going to hit somebody on their right cheek, uh, so most people think uh, that this was the backhanded blow of insult that requires only that kind of dexterity to sweep one's hand backward across the other's Face. I think Scarlett O'Hara laid one on Clark Gable like that. The point is not so much to inflict damage, but to put the other in his place. And most of us don't like being put in our place, uh, especially because we normally believe it is we who should be putting the other in his place. As I've studied this, 
my mind keeps going back to the beatitude, blessed are the meek. Blessed are the meek. Remember, the meek person is the one who is satisfied with God's judgment of him. Uh, what others think or, or say about him becomes like water on a duck's back when, because he knows in part that he, in reality, deserves worse and only God's regard for him is his concern. And I think this was in the Lord's mind. Be willing to give up your right to retaliate when another insults you. Leave your reputation in the Lord's hands. Well, we should mention quickly uh, that some have objected that there must be times when we'll be obligated to respond in kind. For example, when God's honor is involved. And they point to the scene in John chapter 18 at the trial of Jesus before the high priest when one of the priest's officers struck Jesus on the cheek and the Lord appeared uh, to upbraid the official. He said, if I've spoken wrongly, testify of the wrong. But if rightly, why do you strike me? We all know that scene. But Jesus' response really clarifies the meaning here in the sermon. The situation before the high priest involved the law. And adherence to the law was something that the Lord believed in. And he was correcting the abuse of the law, not of himself. As it concerned himself, he would not have been in their presence in the first place had he not determined to turn the other cheek in the greatest, to the greatest extent and entrusting himself to his father in a way no one ever has. That was the great example of turning the other cheek. His second illustration in verse 40 has to do with holding on to your material possessions. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. So the background is the, uh, the legal contention in which the follower of Jesus risked losing his shirt. <laughs> I think many of you have some knowledge of the fashion of the day uh, from your study of the Bible. It was typical for a man uh, to wear a, a long uh, shirt uh, or, or tunic over his undergarment. Uh, but if the weather was cold, like it is in Chicago, uh, he, would have a, uh, add, he would add a cloak, a, a coat, in order to keep warm, warm. And I know all the different translations you have translate these words differently, but that's the idea. Over the undergarments, this long shirt or tunic, over that to keep warm, a cloak or a, a coat. Uh, cult culturally, in fact, that, that outer garment had come to be re recognized as so important that laws were in effect uh, preventing a lender from withholding a debtor's cloak, which he may have taken as collateral, the lender, uh, with, with withholding that cloak overnight so that the probably poor man would not be left bereft of that very necessary garment for warmth. And so it's the most important garment, and Jesus' point is that his followers ought to be willing even to throw in that outer coat as well to the one who was after his shirt. He would relinquish even that which was undeniably his, it, by law, his, his outer cloak. And what this means for us, I think obviously, is that as believers in Christ, we are to hold on to our material possessions loosely and consider them not as ours to own, but merely as gifts from the Lord of which we are stewards, uh, tasked with using them for His glory and not strictly for personal gain. You know, very easy thing to say, uh, not so easy to put into to practice. The same applies to our time. The third of the Lord's illustrations in verse 41, whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him two. Now this one will not make a lot of sense to us unless we consider the, the political and sociological 
uh, milieu from which this comes. The, the Jews were living in an occupied country and the Romans were their uh, rulers and their superiors. Any Roman soldier could legally commandeer an ordinary non-Roman citizen to assist him along his way for a portion of some errand he was, he was running. And the New Testament example, you remember, was when at, at, at the crucifixion, uh, they commandeered Simon of Cyrene to carry Jesus' cross. They pressed him into service. And what Jesus was saying was that when such an inconvenient interruption comes, a disciple of his must show a willingness, not just to go one mile, for example, with him, but even two miles. It may have been inconvenient, it was inconvenient, uh, but a follower of Jesus would do it cheerfully as unto the Lord and even offer to go that extra mile. I worked for a, a man for many years who's really his trademark motto was there's no traffic on the extra mile. What that meant was that our company, we would do things and serve our clients and customers uh, to such an extent that uh, nobody else was out there with us. Well, here's an even greater goal, to go the extra mile in order to serve the one who went so far for us. That's the challenge. Will we go the extra mile for him? Time is a precious commodity. Uh, anyone active in family and industry and ministry is acutely aware of just how precious time is. And the Lord would have us know that our time is not our own, but it belongs to him and is given as a gift to us. And when the Lord interrupts our agenda, as he often does, to ask us to give some back to him, we should never hesitate. The last illustration from verse 42 concerns money. We don't need any lessons on money, do we? Well, it's similar to the second example about material possessions. Give to him who asks of you and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. Uh, be a cheerful giver, in other words. Uh, don't be tight-fisted, uh, but rather uh, give cheerfully. Give sacrificially. That is the model of the apostolic church in the New Testament. Give sacrificially. Give cheerfully. Give as God blesses. That doesn't mean we shouldn't be wise in our stewardship, wise in our giving. God calls us to be good stewards of our, the money that he has entrusted to us so that we will have the resources to give when the proper occasion arises. These are things that uh, leaders of a church, elders of a church wrestle with all the time. Uh, being a good steward of our money that the Lord has given to us. It's the Lord's money. So you know, how to be good stewards of the money. Well, this command can be misunderstood and skewed as well. All of them can. Uh, we mentioned the beggars on the street. Uh, what is the wise and loving response to such as those beggars? Every person must decide in his or her own heart, but there is wisdom in knowing what the money passing through your car window is going to be used for. This is a very challenging thing, especially today, I think. Living in our Western world with all the increase in standards of living that have come as a consequence of our capitalist free enterprise system and the, the freedom of innovation it provides. We're the wealthiest nation that has ever existed. I know there's poverty, uh, but there's fewer poor people. I'm not getting into politics, but we are the wealthiest nation that has ever uh, existed. Uh, but that's just the problem, and, and one the scriptures highlight, that the more we have, it seems, the more we are prone to the love of money, and the more we forget that it has come to us, not strictly 
by our industry and ingenuity, but above all from the hand of the Lord. That's where our material possessions, our money has come from. And so let this be our guide. Uh, the Bible does not leave us in the dark. This is what the Apostle John wrote in 1 John chapter 3, whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. And we will know by this that we are of the truth and we will assure our heart before him. Well, there's not one of us who does not feel aggrieved when we feel we've been deprived of our rights. What Jesus taught was that we have no rights other than those given us in trust from the Lord. Therefore, in our conduct, we are to behave as though we have no rights at all. We don't have the right to retaliate when we're insulted, nor do we have the right to our material possessions, nor our time, nor even what we think is our hard-earned money. They are all held in trust by us from the Lord. Well, all this focus on what could in any of these circumstances take place in a context of animosity leads naturally into Jesus' consideration of love, hatred, and enemies in verses 43 and following. We like the company of good friends, and we find it easy, or at least easier, to love them than those we don't know, or, or worse, our enemies. But disciples are to be different and are to more closely resemble their God, and He is a loving God. Therefore, those who belong to Him should love as He loves. We should love as He loves. So Jesus addresses it. And I want to assure you I'm going to spend less time on these last verses than, than the ones before, but... At first, as has been the pattern, he lays out the law of love misconstrued. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now you see what they were doing. Uh, here we have a full truth. It was said, you shall love your neighbor. That's right out of Leviticus 19. Uh, here too is a serious omission. Uh, the actual text reads, you shall love your neighbor as your Self. That's the largest expression of love we can have, isn't it? To, to love another as we love ourselves. And lastly, there is this serious and wrong-headed addition not found in the law. You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Remember, the Jewish leaders were always trying to restrict the provisions of the law that they found difficult to abide by and expand the allowances the law gave meant to limit their abuse. So here they had qualified what it meant to be a, a neighbor. Uh, their neighbor, they reasoned, was only one of their own people, only a Jew. And since any others could not be classified as a neighbor, then the next step, uh, logically, was to consider them as their enemies. Uh, they had chosen to forget, or at least to neglect, Another provision of the law in Leviticus 17.34, which reads, The stranger among you shall be to you as the native, and you shall love him as yourself. And so the Lord corrects their error in verse 44. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. In other words, they were to love and pray for the very ones who had been construed as their persecutors according to the four previous examples, those who had insulted them and tried to take advantage of them. Now, that can be especially difficult to do. <laughs> Understatement alert here. Uh, it's one thing to ponder the profundity of it sitting here in Sunday school on on Sunday morning. Yes, I hear what Jesus is saying. I'm going to start loving my enemies. And I'm going to add a few of them to my prayer list. In fact, that's probably the, the best way to start. 
pull out that prayer list, if you have it with you, pull out that prayer list and think through who is, is going to, to be on my list. You won't draw a blank. Their images <laughs> will come to uh, your mind. Uh, these are the people who keep me awake at night. These are the ones who are currently making my life miserable. Uh, these, this one is the person wasting my time every day. Uh, this other one is the person I wish God would remove from my life. <laughs> Wait a minute, this is going the wrong way here. It's difficult to love and pray for your enemies and for those who rub you so much the wrong way. Here are some, some tips as the, the teacher looks at himself in the mirror, okay? Here are some tips. Show a little humility. Dig down deep for your meekness. Be poor in spirit. It may help to remember that lost people act like uh, lost people. You know, the natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. They're foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them. They're spiritually appraised. It may help to remember that the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. Remember that you were once like them. It's a good exercise every now and then to think back of some of the really stupid things that you once did. To love your enemies and pray for them is a way to show to others, if not to yourself, that you are related to your heavenly Father who himself loves his enemies. This is one way we can show whose sons, whose daughters we are. And that's the meaning of Jesus' words in verse 45. Look there, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. In loving our enemies, we will prove conclusively whose sons we are because that is when we distinguish ourselves as loving as He loved. He causes His Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. That's common grace. God is indiscriminate in his love. In fact, he is so indiscriminate that while you and I were yet sinners, in fact, the fact is we were enemies, he sent his son to die for us. God loves his enemies. So for you and I to love merely others who return the favor, that's really saying nothing. As a matter of fact, that is in reality self-love because deep down we know there's something in it for us. In that, we're no better than the ones we love to criticize and look down upon, people like the despised tax collectors. And the Lord asks the question, if you love only those who love you, what reward do you have do not even the tax collectors do the same? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? The answer is yes, they do. They do the same. Anyone can reciprocate friendliness. How are you? Fine. How are you? Good. Even tax collectors, even Gentiles do that. Alfred Plummer pierced the truth of it when he wrote this. To return evil for good is devilish. To which return good for good is human. To re return good for evil is divine. The Lord concludes the section in verse 48. Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Morris said, there is a wholeheartedness about being a Christian. I like that. There is a wholeheartedness about being a Christian. In Leviticus, God says, you be holy as I am holy. Those are challenging words. Now Jesus says, you be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Was he casting a net too far? Did he think his demand was achievable? The future for the believer in Jesus Christ holds great promise, but we are to aim for it 
in the here and now. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, Paul wrote, for it is God who is at work within you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. All our hopes are bound up in the love of God for sinners, so great that he did not withhold his only son, but delivered him up for us all. Thank God for a Savior who loved us when we were as yet his enemies, and let us strive by the grace of God uh, to follow in his steps. Let that be our prayer. Lord, thank you for this lesson. Thank you for the Sermon on the Mount. We look forward, if you're willing, uh, to continue it in the weeks ahead. Great truths, uh, great glory to be found uh, in you in those verses. But as it is, we've been challenged this morning in a great way, and we need uh, the ministry of your Spirit uh, to be able to fulfill these demands from our Lord. Um, Lord, maybe may you sanctify us in that way more and more so that uh, we, we are willing to relinquish our rights. We are willing to hold on to our possessions loosely, knowing that they are a stewardship from you, to look at our enemies and, and those that we really don't like very much, and to consider that you love enemies. You love enemies. You loved us when we were your enemies. And for us to exercise a, a meekness uh, and humility and to reach out and love those people. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.